originally from England, Arkansas. I grew up um, there, went to school in the public school system. Uh, parents um, were, you know, I guess back then we didn't realize we were poor, but I guess we were poor. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in a small, small town just outside of Little Rock, Arkansas. It's about 30 minutes away. England is sandwiched between Little Rock, Arkansas and Pine Bluff, Arkansas. So we're kind of like in the middle. Uh, graduated from um, high school there and attend college in Conway, Arkansas at, at the University of Central Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, and uh, graduated from there and moved here to San Antonio. So that's pretty much um, how I got to be here in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. Is uh, gra I graduated, got married, and came here. But growing up in, in England, Arkansas, as we all know, the, um, the Little Rock Nine, Arkansas is famous for, our de for desegregation with the Little Rock Nine. Just to give you a little history about that, um, that was in 1957. I was born in 1962. And I started um, elementary school, first grade, and desegregated. Even, I was born in 62. So that just kind of tells you the history as to when the Little Rock Nine occurred. I wasn't even on the scene. But as a six-year-old, I started first grade. Uh, at God Trail um, Elementary. Uh, it was still holding on, desegregated. We were forced, finally forced, to close that school. Uh, and I came, I started second grade at England Elementary. So my first grade year, well, I experienced just being in a small black um, school. And then we merged uh, during my second grade year. And that was pretty interesting. Um, yes, what was that transition like? So that transition was a little little different. Some of the some of the kids from God Trail parents had already decided even before to go ahead and merge into our little public school that uh, England elementary school before that time. My family, we held out. And, uh, and so I experienced the first year, which was very loving and supportive. Not to say that England was not, but that first year as a second grader, I think I w that was my first introduction, I guess, to um, um, a, a, a sense of prejudice because I grew up with my family and the community that I lived in. We were, we were happy and, and it, was, it was a good, safe environment. Um, when I started at England Elementary School, not that it wasn't safe, but there was just little things that I noticed. Oh, you may not know anything about this yet, or you guys may not have talked about this. As a second grader, I remember uh, being um, made different, I guess to say. There were four, three black kids in my um, second grade class. Um, they, our class set up were, you know, um, the classes were set up like first grade A, first grade B, first grade C, and it was really based on your grades, uh, what kind of grades you received. And so the three of us, there were three, three of us that transferred over into the second grade at England. And we were, there were several, several kids that were smart, but only three of us made it to the second grade A class. And so we three little black kids were set, we were lined up on a row together. And when our teacher taught our class, she would talk about something at the second grade level uh, um, lesson, and she would then turn and say, you all may not know this already and then go in to explain. A lot of the information, we were right on point. And, uh, and, uh, and so, all through elementary school, um, our grades, our classes were set up like that. And so we were the three that went through first, through second, third, fourth, fifth grade in the A class. And a lot of our classmates from before 
our first grade. Kids that were smarter, they were smart, but for whatever reason never got into that A class. So that's just a little bit about the elementary background. Um, middle school, high school, really, I mean, we, we, I was a good, no problems. I, I graduated with honors from high school and received a scholarship, went off to the University of Central Arkansas uh, in Conway and uh, uh, was very involved in school there. Um, uh, and um, I can't really say that I experienced a lot of prejudice or anything of that sort. I was pretty vocal in elementary school. Uh, in high school, I did not. I did not feel that. I think I was probably the environment that I was surrounded um, allowed me to be be me. I, I never experienced that. It wasn't until I think uh, older that I experienced some some of those. You would think that that would happen during that time, but our small town. It was pretty friendly. Um, people knew once you know they we knew of each other, um, and I think once we became once the schools integrated, um, you know, we knew of others. But once the school integrated, it blended quite well. Our little little hometown of school uh, got we got along quite quite well, um, and so for kids, I can't say as as a young teenager no no I, I I don't have any any memories of any uh, real issues um, that I can bring to the forefront um, went off to college and college was a big different scene um, there were there were some subtle instance instances that made me think hmm I'm not sure that was right um, but nothing that was really, oh, you know, just right in your face. And I think um, high school, college um, were good years for me. Um, I graduated from college and moved here, moved to San Antonio. My first, my, we got, I got married and uh, we moved here to um, San Antonio. My husband being um, um, in the military, and so we came here by way of military. And uh, the military is great, um, we're, but it was outside, outside the military. We did not live on, um, on post. We lived in the city. And um, there were subtle, just subtle things. Um, you know, it's easy to let things slide, I guess. It's like just just for instance, uh, I'll never forget one day, I was in the grocery store, and I was in the grocery store, and um, I'm standing at the produce um, aisle, and I'm picking produce, and this a Caucasian lady just walked right up in front of me, reached right over, didn't I say, excuse me, pardon me, oh, I'm sorry, just, and I thought, this is not appropriate. And um, she did it a second time. And finally I said, I'm sorry. If you don't mind, can you allow me to finish? And I'll move out of your way. And she said, well, I'm just trying to get my produce. I said, but is it right for you to cross over and, and extend your, you know, your hand over past me to get your produce? I wouldn't do that to you. And I think that was the first time I noticed um, little things. I think I grew up, and I'm sure there were others that I did not pay attention to, but I think at that point in my life, 
is when I really started to take notice and making sure that, you know, I'm respected. If I'm going to respect you, then I need you to respect me in return. There's no way would I ever would have walked in front of someone and uh, and begin to reach for pro produce or, you know, little things like that. Never would do that. I would not do that. And I think sometimes, you know, that was the first time that I think for me that I thought, okay, wait, this is just too, that's just too much. Uh, and it's the little things sometimes we forget about or we, we as a race, I think for us as a race of people, we uh, a lot of time let the small things um, slide. And I think we have to realize at some point in your life you realize no more. And, I, and that was probably the first. Um, I, another incident was I applied for a job, and I was here uh, after I had um, moved to San Antonio and applied for a job. I felt that I did really well on the, the application. It was a test, everything, everything. I did right. Waited to hear back. Um, everyone was waiting to get a response that you're hired. Um, did not hear from the job. It was a, a government job. It was a city government job, state job. Never, never did hear anything back. Fortunately for me, there was uh, a person I knew that said, that worked with the city, with the state, and she asked me, have you heard back on that job situation? She said, because I heard you scored well. I said, I have not heard. Um, and thankfully, she was an advocate for me because she inquired. And for some reason, I still don't know to this day, my application just kind of was left on the side. But she was an advocate for me, and, uh, and so I got a phone call. And I think um, that's what we have to do. If you see something or recognize that something kind of off, uh, we have to step up. And so um, I am eternally grateful um, to this person for, for stepping up. She was my advocate, and I think that's something that's important. And so I try going forward to be an advocate for others. If I see something that's quite not right, uh, I will voice my opinion. I'll say, hey, what about this, you know? And I think we have to remember that because um, it's so easy of some time for people to disregard us, you know, we can be disregarded. And so, um, and I think we all have to remember to pay it forward. So if someone's helped you, then you have to remember to help someone. And so I was, I knew, and, and no, nothing, no one ever said anything, but in the back of my mind, uh, there were several candidates, and I was the only African-American, only black, applying at that time. And I had great scores, and I, was, I qualified for the job, but my application was left on the side. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that, that was um, uh, not a, I ne that was, I guess, inadvertently, I don't know. I'll say, I'll be kind and say, it was maybe just an accident, but it happened. And it was something that um, someone stood up for me, and I, I really appreciate that. Um, I think probably um, growing up, raising our family here in, in San Antonio has been overall a great experience. Something about San Antonio, uh, we are such a diverse culture. You know, there's so many versions of us. Um, it's a melting pot, I should say. And so we'll fit quite well here. Um, but I, I remember in 1995, my husband and I were um, getting ready. My husband had was, was being stationed. We were still active duty military. And uh, we were getting ready to be stationed in Fayetteville, North Carolina. In 1995, we were um, driving from San Antonio, Texas to Fayetteville, North Carolina. We had just crossed the um, Louisiana state line 
and it was daylight. Um, I had a brand new minivan. It was, uh, you know, a young mom with little ones, and we had, my van was so cute. It was green, uh, dark tinted windows, you know. I was repping the mama, the mama van. I was in the mama van, and we were driving it. Dark tent, new vehicle, and uh, we got stopped. I was driving, and I thought, I'm not, I'm not speeding, um, I'm alert, I, I'm on the expressway, um, I'm fine. We were pulled over, and a, a police car pulled up behind us, another police car came, and there's lights all over, and get out of the car, get out of the car, get out of the car. Um, and I was just floored, and I'm like, I haven't done anything. And my husband, it's a little, he's more quieter than I am. He's not as vocal as I, I am at some time. I'm like, I haven't done anything. And they demanded that we get out of the car. They separated us, um, you know, and, you know, it was three cop cars. Uh, and they just kept us there. I'm on the side of the road um, in tall grass. Where are you going? Is this your vehicle? Uh, what's in your vehicle? And, you know, and then they asked me questions. They go ask him asked him questions. It was just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It felt like eternity. Um, and in that moment, in 1995, I remember as a black person, you just, you never know, this can happen. It can happen to you, you know? You never know when, it can happen. We had done nothing wrong. And after talking to him talking to me. I guess they felt our stories matched. Uh, they ran our car tags. They, I mean, our license, uh, everything. He's like, I'm a captain in the military. Actually, he was a major. I'm sorry. He made major at that point. And he expressed, you know, I'm in the military. We're on our way traveling because we're getting ready to PCS to another, another location. Did not matter. Uh, and when they finally was satisfied, um, they let us go. And I think at that moment, when you think that you've arrived in, in, in society and everybody's accepting and we all are equal, it's stuff like that that will remind you that equality is still something we're working towards. And we drove, I remember getting in our van, and, and we were so happy and just carefree, carefree, enjoying that afternoon. And just that quick, it just turned it for us. And we drove probably I, I, the rest of the evening pretty much in silence because we couldn't believe he served his country. Uh, there, we were doing nothing wrong. And we were, I, I to this day, we were profiled. We were stopped because we were a young black couple in a new vehicle. Uh, and we just crossed the state line and they just assumed we had to be up to no good. And I, to, I, I will forever in my gut feel that that's why. And that, those are the kind of things that, um, you know, you try to push out of the way and say, eh, it was just, a, just that, it was just an incident. But you hear of it so much. And in that, and I think back now, um, we could have easily lost our lives or something could have gone wrong. God, I, had I, you know, had I not, um, like I said, I'm more vocal, so I had to try to calm myself down. <laughs> But it could have really gone, it really could have gone left, you know. It could have really been bad. Um, but those are the kind of things, I think, as an adult, um, again, like I say, as a child, I did not notice. I just didn't notice. It's not that it wasn't there, but I think as a child I didn't notice. Um, but then I think as I grew older and when you start to have your own family, and the protection of your children. So then I start to notice things in reference to my family and my kids and 
a playing on the playground and we're in a public playground and my little my daughter is playing and she's happy and a little white girl they're playing together uh, another little girl comes over and they're playing together and then all of a sudden one of the moms come and grab their little girl and take her away wasn't nothing going wrong and you know and I see you see that and I thought you know you just don't get it uh, at, at that so even even at that uh, as a young mother I saw some of that uh, but um, but I have to say um, for me I've had I've been blessed I've heard of friends I know of some some friends and acquaintances that have had other issues, but for me, I've been really blessed. And so, but one of the things I do try to do is if I see something that's not right, I have to speak up. I just have to. Um, just because maybe I haven't been affected like others, or my story, my story is not this, it's probably minute compared to some others, you know. It's not minute. Well, but I mean, and I got you, Dramatics. but 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 yes, but because my experiences, I can't say that I've had some real, um, real horrible, horrible, um, tragic um, experiences, and I know of some people who have. But even though I I have it, I have to be conscientious of those that have, and I have to I have to speak out. And if I see something that I think is just not appropriate, I, I have to. So I think the biggest thing that we as a race of people have to realize is that even if you yourself was blessed and fortunate not to uh, experience some of the things that others, it does not, uh, does not excuse you from saying something. It may not directly affect you, but it affected you inadvertently mm -hmm. because it's us and you have to. And then not just to say, um, not just to say uh, based on racial um, being black versus Hispanic or white, any type of injustice, it's just not acceptable. And so we have to speak up, have to. Okay. I've talked too much. No, no, this is about you. This is about you. This is your moment to shine, please. <laughs> um, I guess one thing I can ask you is, you said speak up. How do you feel that someone can speak out or be an advocate for bringing, um, helping to get rid of racial discrimination. Um, how can someone be an advocate if they don't know how to speak out? Hmm. Or what is an I, example of something that you've done? To I out? think um, I think in order to speak out, I've, well, first you have to recognize it, and if you if you see it. If you if it's your gut if you, your gut is telling you something is not quite right, then listen to your gut. Um, you have to be able to recognize it. And I don't want everybody to be uh, have their radar up and in that uh, you feel that anything no one can say anything to you or you know just just be too uh, you know just, just don't don't have it so high. You don't have to kick up the turn the volume up too high. But if you just kind of pay attention, and I think um, you have to realize, and if your gut is telling you that there's something, then you need to figure out. If you're afraid to speak up, um, maybe maybe you not may, maybe you may not necessarily have to say something, but you can either do something to uh, change the um, change the. Um, um, the dynamics. So if you don't say something, then maybe it'd be easier to just remove, oh, come on and go with me. You know, if you see a situation that there's something being said and it's not appropriate and maybe you don't want to say, call them out on it, 
but maybe you want to, you know, just come in and interject or move to change the subject or something. But I think you have to do something. Um, and then I think over time you will find a voice within, you will find your voice within yourself um, to be able to say. And I think that's what, in, in reference to me, um, there were, I'm sure there were many other instances that things had gone down that I'd seen uh, little things and I didn't say anything. But I think it was that just that, that, one, um, that one grocery store visit <laughs> <laughs> kind of just was like, okay, listen, I cannot continue not to say something. I think it was at that point I had to find my voice um, because I'm sure, you know, there have probably been other times when I've just moved out of the way and, and, and moved to the other side. You know, I'm sure I've experienced that before, but it was just the, on that day, I don't know what it was, uh, but it was just that day that I felt it was, I had to speak up. I had to find my voice and I had to say. Um, but it was, you know, I think everybody, everybody has to find their own voice. And, um, and it's, you know, and if you don't, you're having a hard time voicing it, like I said, then maybe you can think of other ways to divert the situation, move from this, remove yourself from the, res the situation, move that person, change the subject or something. But I think we all have to, we got to do, we have to speak up. Uh, and it may be hard. It may be hard. That first time was a little, I was, I was hesitant, um, but I found my voice and I think, um, I think um, when you know it's right, when you don't, when you know this is right, you'll find your voice, and you'll just speak up. But you know, mm -hmm. it'll it'll come. Right. Okay. So, um, growing up in the early '60s, now we're in the early '20s. <laughs> 2019. It's crazy. I'm like, where did time go? <laughs> I just had a birthday. I am 56 years old. Uh, yeah, yeah, my birthday is Christmas. So Christmas Day, I turned 56. And it's just amazing that I'm sitting, I'm sitting here talking about as a first grader at six years old, being in a, a black school and when I and then starting my second grade year in a, um, a seg segregated, you know, we had desegregated at that point and, and switching from a segregated school to desegregation and everybody being forced. And that's how far behind Arkansas, I hate to say it, but that's how far behind Arkansas was because, you know, Little Rock Nine happened in the late 50s and I was born in 62 and we still had um, separate schools. And so that's pretty, we were just, we were a tad bit slow. <laughs> we, were, we were a little bit slow. And so I started, I grew, I was born in 62 and, uh, and yeah, yeah. Um, so even at that point, but here I am 56 and I'm talking about 50 years ago. Uh, and we have come a long way. But one of the things, uh, we have two daughters. Um, our youngest just got married. We have a 25-year-old and a 31-year-old. And our, our youngest is married now. Um, she's been married six months. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and so um, it's sad to say that, um, I wish I could say that everybody's equal everybody respect each other as equal but that's not the case and I'm sure that they they have experienced some some things and will experience some more um, we've come a long way but we, we still have a long way to go a long way to go so I'm you know mm -hmm. here we are 50 years or, or more than 50 years ago six more than 56 years ago from the inception it was 57. I think it was 57, and, uh, and so it's been a long time, and we're still fighting this fight. Um, and um, 
we will probably be fighting this fight till Jesus come. It's unfortunate to say, but it's probably true. This is going to be, this will be ongoing. So, but yeah, yeah. But I hope that, um, like my mother, uh, my mother and me as a mother, you know, we all, you always hope and pray that things are better than they were. And so we have to, but we have to stay vigilant. And I think a lot of times um, in our young people, we feel like um, uh, everything is good, but not always. And so and I think, um, I think we have to, we have to accept that. That's just life. We just have to accept it. That we we still have a ways to go. So, I'm just looking at some of my questions here. Um, why did you feel it was important to tell your story? I'm gonna tell you. Listen, I actually I have to be honest with you. Actually, I did not come inten intending to tell my story. My husband was here to tell his, and we were riding in together because we have some other events that we have to um, attend to today. And uh, I had not decided to tell my story. I just hadn't. Um, and uh, then when we got here and the ladies out front were so engaging, and they just assumed. <laughs> so they just kind of assumed I was here to tell my story. So I got a pay I ended up getting the paper, and I said, okay, well, I can talk. I can share. Uh, uh, like I said, I, for me, um, I've been blessed. Um, but, you know, I, like I said, I have friends, I, I, I have family members who have experienced some things. Uh, I've been fortunate enough, but, but I think we all, we all have a story. Mm -hmm. we, we all feel something. We, we feel something. something. That is right. That is true. So, um, when, in the 60s and the 70s, was there a pivotal moment in history? Um, it can be anything, any any of the movements, many movements mm -hmm. that were happening mm -hmm. um, during the Civil Rights Movement or prior to. Is there anything that stuck out to you when you heard about it on the news or if you read it in the newspaper? Was there anything when you heard and you were like, wow? And say for me, growing up in rural Arkansas in the 60s, I was born in 62, um, as a kid, I wasn't around it. Um, I did not get the news as much, you know. I mean, we had a television. Um, but I think my family, our, my parents, I have to say, as a little kid growing up, my parents protected me. It wasn't that they wasn't aware. They knew. But as uh, born, born in 62 and as a little kid, I played and my parents protected me from it. So I think as I, when I got older uh, and reading about it and seeing it then, but as far as living it and being uh, born and raised in the, well, in the 60s, uh, early 70s, I did not, uh, my parents protected me. Uh, a lot from that, and I, I'm appreciative of it. Um, I heard about it uh, as I got older, but uh, the '60s, I don't, I don't. Mm -mm. I remember, um, I know the sadness of when uh, Dr. Martin Luther King passed. And, you know that, that stuck out, and I think that was very. Um, um, I remember, you know, the sadness and everyone, um, a loss. Um, and so that would probably be, you know, so hearing, hearing of him and of, 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 um, yeah. So those, those kind of, those were, you know, made big headlines. And so that was something that, um, you know, we were aware, I was aware of. I knew what he stood for, uh, but yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, yeah, I know. I know I wasn't there that day, but I always hear that that was yeah. the, the whole 
whole world got quiet. It got real quiet, yeah. even in the rural, in, in the country. I grew up in the country, and even there, there, it was. I mean, so I knew of him. I knew of him. Did quite at that age, did not quite understand all that he was doing or what he was, what he was providing. Didn't quite understand that part. That came later, but I knew that he was very important and that he was a very important person and it was very hurt. Everybody was very sad and shaken behind his death. But it was a little later that I understood better is what, what it was all about. Okay. So how would um, you say is one way to pursue justice over a racist society? I think one of, one of the things we have to do now, uh, um, we have to be smart about it. Uh, and we have to, um, we have to fight it um, with the laws. Um, and one of the things that we must do is vote. This is a right that was given to us by those who lost their lives. And in order to make change, real change, we can talk about it all we want to, but until we put it into action, and one way of putting it into action is voting. Understanding what you're voting about, the issues, and encouraging everyone to get out and vote. Because that's how our voices are heard. We can't make, you know, if we're gonna really make change, you have to make change through policy. And we have to understand that. Uh, we can rant and rave, and we can have all kinds of uh, uh, marches and sit-ins and whatever else you want, but you have got to use your voice. That is the system, that's the American way. And if we're gonna fight the system, we have to fight the system the way the system is set up. And we have to vote. And in that, in making our, our, our representatives accountable, mm -hmm. calling them to the carpet, and making sure that people are, um, are not forgotten. Um, I just want to say, in my small way, I hope, and what my desire is, we, um, I'm a member of a, a, a local church here on the east side, um, I, I, I Antioch Baptist Church, and um, I work and volunteer, I volunteer uh, on this side of town, and I try to, um, I try to voice and support the issues that will make a difference. And I think that um, even if you're blessed that life for you, um, you're able to move out of some, some scenarios or some instances or change, your lifestyle has changed and it does not affect you directly, we as a race of people still need to rem remember those that are left. Um, that may be uh, subjected more so to some of the injustice. And so I encourage um, people to remember, remember to even if you're okay, think about those that are not and try to serve somewhere and support some kind of way um, those that are not. And that's just, I, we just have to pay it forward. You can, we cannot leave anyone behind. And I, I hope that what I do uh, represent me trying not to leave anyone behind. That's, that's I guess that's it. I, I spend, I'm very blessed to be able to spend a lot of time volunteering and doing some things behind the scene that will help to support and encourage others. So I'm trying not to leave anyone behind. And I, I encourage um, others to think that way think that way.